Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the silver euro cross on the five-minute chart. And uh, I brought this up because it's kind of significant in the way that it's moved since the Greece news broke. Now, this is the initial reaction in silver. You can see that it took a spike up on that news up above 16. And then, of course, the powers that be managed the price down. You can see we took a dip down there to 1550. It looks like we're rolling over. I'll pull it back and show you on another chart. But just to show you the euro here. Now, the initial reaction in the euro was a gap down. You can see that. And then the powers that be, the banks, these are the people behind everything, the governments and the banks, they're in bed together. They rallied the euro. You can see they rallied it to much higher than where it was before the news initially broke. So what does that mean? Well, a lot of people are finding a lot of fundamental reasons for it. I don't I don't really see any, you know, fundamentals for it as far as the future of the euro or anything. It's just manipulation by the banks and the governments. But what's interesting here is now you can see that the euro has is selling off back down to um, below where it was when the Greek news broke, but not silver. Uh, silver is not recovering to where it was before or right when the news broke. Silver is continuing to fall. So that gives them permission to continue their shenanigans. That's what they wanted to do. Now, we're, we're looking for a buying opportunity here. Let me actually pull off the comparison so we can just look at silver. So you can see the rolling over pattern here. Now, I did just recently buy some more of the half ounce goats just because I, I felt at 1187, I felt that I would not see them cheaper than that. And apparently they're not. They're gone on jam bullion. I think Providence still has like 600 of them, but we'll see how long they last. But we're looking for a spike down. Uh, that's normally the pattern of things. And if the pattern continues the way they've been doing it, you can see back to the one that we had, the big spike here back around last year, the end of last year, you can see you, you don't get much time to buy. So that one went all the way down to 1440, but it came from 1650 and it went right back to 1650. So you can see a $2, uh, let's pull it on the daily to see if it was actually one day. Uh, it was over the course of two days. But there really was one day where we got uh, the same day that we had that 1440 price, we came and got uh, almost a $17 price. So you don't get much time on those spikes. Uh, it's possible that we could bounce and rally without getting a spike, but that doesn't really fit the pattern that they've done in the past. So you probably want to be nimble. I don't know how many of the places that you buy coins from are have it marked to market. You have to remember, as we talked about in the Jason Hommel uh, video, you can get into trouble if you're not marked to market. In other words, if you're not hedged in the futures. So I did notice that when I was buying the Jam Bullion ones, they, they were moving with the market. Atmex does, and I believe Provident does, but you'll have to check those because I've seen a lot of times when they kind of shut that off. I've also seen a lot of times where their websites kind of mysteriously go down, right, when you want to pull the trigger. So uh, my bet is going to be about 3 a.m. That's normally when they do things. In fact, I think we just had uh, we had a 4 a.m. one that presaged the, the Greek news that was kind of interesting. You can see this one right here. Uh, about 3, actually that was 3 a.m. So you see that, that took a huge dive and spiked back up. Not a lot of time to buy. Um, so you have to be very nimble. Now let's get to the news here. There's just so much to cover. Uh, I want to start with the post that I put on uh, Puerto Rico. We're going to talk a lot about Puerto Rico and what's going on there. And uh, I've got so many articles. Let me try to find the one that I want to start with. Uh, basically, I put one on the blog that uh, was this supposed interview with the Puerto Rican finance minister. It wasn't. It was just some very, very clever person who dubbed in the the English translation, it wasn't anything to do with what they were saying in Spanish, but it, 
he made it look like this is what the guy was talking about. So it's the finance minister just laughing at the stupid suckers, and especially this guy, John Paulson. Um, and I guarantee you, if the pattern holds, that this guy is going to ask us to come and bail him out. He'll want the taxpayer to bail out his position. This is the caption I put on here. One of the biggest losers in the Greek and Puerto Rican debt crises is hedge fund billionaire John Paulson. Last year, he called the U.S. territory the Singapore of the Caribbean. Can you believe that? So these guys, and we're going to look at a hedge fund manager, a real hedge fund manager, who was actually right and profited for being right, did true analysis. Of course, he was persecuted for that. But this guy, no, he's connected to the Wall Street criminals, banker criminals. But this is a fascinating statistic here that uh, I linked in here to this article that was from Generational Dynamics. And they they go to lo uh, a lot of work to not tell you the facts about what's going on in Puerto Rico. And it's really bad. We're going to see in another one of how many people are leaving. The young people are leaving. A lot of people are leaving. But here's the, the raw economic facts. According to Cohen, the unemployment rate is 13.7%. Only 700,000 of the 3.5 million people that live in Puerto Rico, or 20% of the population work in the private sector. The other 80% are either on welfare, they receive unemployment or other aid, or they work for the government. Now think about that. Remember the videos I've done about too many people in the cart and not enough people pulling Puerto Rico is a perfect example. There is no way you can run an economy by having, and another, the articles I'm going to read here, have over 50% of the people that live there are on welfare. Incredible. But let's look at some of these. I want to start off with uh, a chart, uh, an article, I'm sorry, about uh, AMBAC and MBIA. Now, these guys, if you remember back at the height of the financial crisis, these guys were just right in the thick of things because they were insuring all these bonds. Well, I could have swore that they went bankrupt. It turns out that one did and got reorganized. Another one got mysteriously bailed out. So here they are again, MBIA and AMBAC, uh, these organizations that don't have any real capital that are insuring trillions of dollars of bad debt. And so here it's happening again here. Bond insurers MBIA Inc. and AMBAC Financial are down again Tuesday as concerns over Puerto Rico's ability to repay its debt multiply. Investor fears that both firms face potential for steep losses on their promises to backstop Puerto Rico's $72 billion of debt. MBIA stock closed down 23% Monday and fell more than 10% before rebounding Tuesday. By late afternoon, the stock was down 6%. AMBAC stock fell 12% Monday and was off 14% Tuesday. Shares of the other main insurer of Puerto Rico's debt, Assured Guarantee, which dropped 13% on Monday, are up 2% Tuesday. So these are these bond insurers. Now, I wanted to dig further into this because... You know, looking at the numbers here, why would anybody be loaning money to Puerto Rico? Well, there's a lot of reasons it has to do with uh, being tax-free municipal bonds and other things. But let's go further and look at some more of the facts, and then we're going to dig deeper into MBIA and AMBAC. So this was an article that was actually published uh, in Time Magazine, and this was back in 2014. But it gives you an idea of how bad things are getting. Uh, they're talking about the brain drain here. So there's a lot of people leaving. To make matters worse, the brain drain is occurring as young qualified professionals are fleeing an unemployment rate of 15.4% compared to the 6.6 .6 federal unemployment rate. The fact that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens makes migration much easier and appealing, says Puerto Rican consultant Heidi Calero president of Calero Consulting Group. Currently, Puerto Rico's population is 3.7 million versus 4.9 million Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. mainland. The Census Bureau projects that the island's population will drop to 
million in 2050, a socialist paradise. Around 51% of the island's population is on welfare. Can you believe that? Think about that. That is completely unsustainable. How do you make them participate in the economy? The size of the island's underground economy was recently estimated at approximately $20 billion. And that's just an approximation since nobody really knows how much revenue goes unaccounted for. So that's crazy. The, that's just like Greece. Everybody works for the government, takes government handouts, and nobody pays any taxes. So this is a chart of MBIA. Now this is actually one that I shorted uh, multiple times because I looked into the fundamentals as well. And of course, the fundamentals never matter until they do, right? That's exactly what happened in the financial crisis. Now you can see that this stock pretty much never recovered. It's got a billion dollar market cap now. I guess that's cut in half from this high, but you can see that this is limping along. Of course it should have gone bankrupt and it should have gone away. And, uh, but why didn't it? Well, because the corrupt Wall Street banks and corrupt cronies in the government, they need these rating agencies to keep this gigantic Ponzi scheme going. Now, here's another one on Puerto Rico's debt. And you can see here, here's the share. Padilla warned that by 2025, the island could have bond debt of up to $40,000 for every man, woman, and child in a territory with high unemployment where the average annual wage is less than $20,000. Incredible. So let's dig further into these insurers. I'm closing these because I have so many open. First, I want to look at these two, AMBAC and MBIA. Uh, before I look at the Wikipedia entry on these, let's go back to one of Mish's um, polemics here. Back in December of 2007, Mish saw this coming. Insurance from MBIA and AMBAC is worthless. And he goes into it, he goes into Moody's, you know, all the shenanigans with Moody's and how they were threatened and how they are corrupt and how they are compromised. Um, but let's uh, go down to his conclusion here. The charade of pretending will continue. Now this is before the last financial crisis. You would have thought that it would have ended. Nope, they are keeping it on life support. As long as Moody's, Fitch, and the S&P get paid by the companies whose debt they rate, the charade of pretending will continue. Sadly, it is in the financial best interest for all involved in the scam for the pretending to go on as long as possible. Rather than getting paid based on the accuracy of reports, government sponsorship of the big three ensure they get business no matter how deeply flawed their analysis is. And let's face it, there have been some enormous lapses in judgment by all three to the point of actual fraud investigations into the rating agencies by Ohio Attorney General Mark Dan. So not only are the guarantees of the insurers worthless, so are any ratings made by the big three. Moody's comes flat out and says it themselves. This is from Moody's Code of Conduct. Quote, Moody's has no obligation to perform and does not perform due diligence. That's a direct quote from Moody's. Can you believe that? This is the agency that is charged with rating these bonds and the safety of them and is, and is uh, protected by law because a lot of the funds, retirement funds and pension funds are required to have ratings uh, for them to be able to buy those bonds. So these people are right in bed with the government. And of course, there's Fitch. And uh, so that's that's his take on it. Enough already. Government sponsorship of the rating agencies created the problem. The solution is simple. Government unsponsorship of the rating agencies. So let's look at these two that are back in trouble again. It's MBIA and AMBAC. Now, the first thing that came to mind for me was how did these companies survive? So I started digging and looking into this, and what we find is that we have some interesting characters come in. So let's look at AMBAC here first. AMBAC and other bond guarantors such as MBI, 
A, were hit hard by the 2007 subprime mortgage financial crisis, and on January 18, 2008, its Fitch credit rating was lowered from AAA to AA when its plan plans to raise $2 billion in new capital failed. Moody's and S&P, however, chose to affirm Ambex's AAA rating with their agencies after it succeeded in raising $1.5 billion in new capital in March 2008. In early 2008, the specter of major bond guarantors failing to be able to pay off insurance claims on trillions of dollars of securities backed by subprime mortgages and other securitized debt led to attempts to shore them up with infusions of capital. So that's the one I want to chase down here. That's footnote six, and that takes us to this article here. And uh, as you know, Wiki requires you to source your information. Of course, half the time when you click on a link on Wiki, it goes to a dead link. So uh, you know what my opinion of Wiki is. Anyway, but here is this article about how they got this infusion of cash. It says, to avoid a possible crisis, insurance regulators met with representatives of about a dozen banks on Wednesday to discuss ways to shore up the insurers by injecting fresh capital. Okay, so you see what happened there? These people are being bailed out by the banks, and these are the same banks that were bailed out by you and me, the taxpayer. And this was in January of 2008. So it was already starting to crumble and these banks that ended up getting bailed out, bailed out these companies, that's what happened. So that's AMBAC. Now I wanna look at MBIA because this one is extremely interesting because we have this, this, I'll say, vendetta by this hedge fund manager, Bill Ackman. Remember I mentioned John Paulson is the guy who said that Puerto Rico is going to be the Singapore of the Western world. You think about how ridiculous and stupid a statement like that is in a country where more than 50% of the people are on welfare and 80% of the people either are on welfare or work for the government. It's absolute insane insanity for him to make that statement. Now, this is interesting because you go to the wiki entry on MBIA, and I'll just read it here. MBIA Inc. is a financial services company. It was founded in 1973 as the Municipal Bond Insurance Association. And by the way, AMBAC was founded in 1971. Isn't that interesting? 1971 and 1973, right when the U.S. went on to a free-floating, unbacked, paper fiat standard, they created these insurance companies. It's headquartered in Armonk, New York, and has approximately 400 employees. MBIA is the largest bond insurer. Now think about that. It's the largest bond insurer. And then we read here, MBIA is a monoline insurer primarily of municipal bonds and on asset-backed securities and mortgage-backed securities. Financial insurance or financial guarantees are a form of credit enhancement. It also provides a fixed income asset management service with about $40 billion under management. A consortium of insurance companies, this is the history of AMBAC. This is where it gets interesting. So here we get the history of AMBAC. A consortium of insurance companies, Aetna's, Fireman's, Travelers, Cigna, and Continental Foreign Municipal Bond Insurance Association in 1973 to diversify their holdings in municipal bonds. The company went public in 1987. Okay, well, that's interesting. Can we get more about the company? Nope, we go straight into Bill Ackman. And this is the hedge fund manager that I was talking about. In 2002, Bill Ackman, a hedge fund manager, began researching which concentrate began research which concentrated on challenging MBIA's AAA rating, despite an ongoing probe by of his trading by New York state and federal authorities. He was charged with copying fees for copying 725,000 pages of statements regarding the financial services company in his law firm's compliance with the subpoena. Ackman has called for a division between MBIA's bond insurer structured finance business and their municipal bond insurance side. And this goes on, it goes on about Ackman. Okay, where's the history of MBIA? This is nothing but Ackman. So there is just corrupt Wikipedia again. But let me show you how deep this corruption runs. This guy, Bill Ackman, he was a hedge fund manager and he bet 
against this company. Fortunately, they wrote this book called Confidence Game. How hedge fund sorry, how hedge fund manager Bill Ackman called Wall Street's bluff. It was published in 2011 and this is very interesting because you see this is a real hedge fund manager. This is a guy who put his money where his mouth was. He said, "I think this is a Ponzi scheme. I think these rating agencies and insurance companies, municipal insurance companies, I think these guys are cooking the books and I'm going to short them and I'm going to bet against them. So uh, this book is the story of it, but you get some hints about the corruption just by reading the reviews. Here's one review. In 2002, hedge fund manager Bill Ackman used credit derivatives to place a short bet against MBIA, the largest of municipal bond insurers. Ackman later bet against other bond insurers. Ackman raised serious accounting issues with MBIA executives, rating agencies, regulators, industry analysts. Among other things, Ackman questioned MBIA's foray into credit derivatives and synthetic CDOs. Joseph J. Brown, MBIA's then chairman and CEO, met with Ackman in 2002 about a negative report Ackman was about to release. Ackman recalls this power play. Quote, you're a young guy early in, early in your career. You should think long and hard before issuing the report. We're the largest guarantor of New York State and New York City bonds. In fact, we're the largest guarantor of municipal debt in the country. Let's put it this way. We have friends in high places. Now, you know what happened right after that? Elliot Spitzer investigated him. So the Wikipedia implies that he was uh, be, you know, a guy that you can't trust. And no, this is retaliation. After the threat, Ackman published the report on his fund's website. Is MBIA triple A? Here's some ironic background you won't find in Confidence Game. In 2003, Jack Cowett, then vice chairman of MBIA, he left in early 2005, wrote a blurb still visible on Amazon for my book. This is the guy who's reviewing it. On the dangers of credit derivatives and synthetic CDOs. And he gives his book. He began, caveat emptor, never in the history of finance has this warning become more appropriate. That's the former um, vice chairman of MBIA. Ackman's concerns were reasonable. Structured finance is easily gamed and fraud was common. Moreover, Ackman was correct about several other accounting issues unrelated to synthetic CDOs. When his initial bet didn't pay off, the financial media strafed him. Ackman persisted. MBIA protested in early 2003. SEC and New York Attorney General's Office investigated him. The New York Attorney General's Office, then headed by Elliot Spitzer, grilled Ackman for six days. Ackman's activism eventually led to a two-year investigation of MBIA, resulting in its restating seven years of earnings and a $75 million fine. So Ackman was right. Do you see how it easy, easy it is for them to sick their dogs, Elliot Spitzer and the SEC, on a guy who was right the whole time? Ackman didn't stop. He hired a top forensic accounting expert, and several times brought evidence of fraudulent accounting to Moody's, the leading credit rating agency. Meanwhile, MBIA restated its numbers twice. At the end of 2005, Ackman wrote Moody's board of directors. We'll skip that. MBIA escalated its risk. MBIA wrote credit derivatives on new AAA risk back by malignant mortgage loans, including built-to-fail mezzanine CDOs. It didn't matter how much confidence Wall Street rating agencies, bond insurers, and regulators had in maintaining a collective financial lie. MBIA was unstable. In February 2008, MBIA cut its dividend and suspended structure finance activities. Jay Brown wrote MBIA's investors that Ackman's campaign was an attempt to destroy his business. Ackman's shorts weren't the problem. MBIA could have used some shorts of its own since it was long with too little coverage. MBIA had insured rotting mortgage risk with too little capital and to maintain an even investment grade rating. By 2000, June 2008, MBIA and AMBAC, the largest municipal bond insurers, lost their AAA ratings and slid fast from there. At the end of 2008, Ackman took $1.1 billion in gains for Pershing Square, enough to offset losses in other investments, some of which subsequently rebounded.
Wall Street banks with financial ties to mortgage lenders fueled bad and often fraudulent mortgage lending, created phony mislabeled securities, and offloaded the temporarily disguised risks on bond insurers, MBIA, AMBAC, AIG, FGIC, and more. As naive investors to keep the Ponzi scheme going. A housing bubble fueled by corrupt finance damaged the U.S. economy and taxpayers bailed out the chief culprits. Those with friends in high places did the most damage to the nation's economy and personally profited the most. It's also noteworthy that Ackman's outrage was not directed at investment banks with whom he had traded and that underwrote and created fraudulent value-destroying CDOs against which they bought bond insurance, fed him internal CDO data, internal CDO models, and information on MBIAs and AMBAC's positions that Ackman made public, all of which bolstered his confidence to continue his short positions. The high pay of Wall Street and its cronies doesn't reflect efficient markets or individual brilliance. It's a market failure. The great bailout protected debt holders and some shareholders in corrupt financial institutions. Culprits involved in phony securitizations that damaged the economy have windfall gains are now heavily subsidized with taxpayer dollars. So this, I'm actually, I think I'm going to get the Kindle version and read this confidence game. How hedge fund manager Bill Ackman called Wall Street's bluff. So now it's happening again, but this time it's actually much worse because these companies have never even even recovered. One went bankrupt and got a bunch of phony money from Wall Street, and the other one uh, just went down 90% and has hovered there and, and now is tanking. So it's happening right now again. Uh, it's you know it's it might be the one that that sends us over the edge. I'm not sure. They may be able to pull this back from the brink, like they've done so many other times. Um, whether Greece or Puerto Rico are are going to you know be the final nail in the coffin that brings the system down or begins that snowball effect. We don't know, but we know what the ultimate result is going to be. It's going to be the same thing, but worse as what happened last time. They just papered over stuff, and it's going to happen again. So we're watching silver tonight. is going to be a big night, probably for the next couple days, for a buy-the-dip sort of moment. Um, all this paper is going to be evaporated, and everybody is going to be left with nothing. If that's not the case, and they don't just simply renege on all of the paper... Uh, they're going to inflate it away, and the dollars that uh, represent that debt are going to become worthless. One or the other, it's an inevitability, and we'll talk to you next time.